being a computer engineer or software developer, I made a dinky little website called SpanishLessonsOnline.com. It's still there if anybody wants to look at it. It's an awful, awful website. <laughs> um, and we just threw it up there. I did basic SEO since we were one of the first people to offer it, kind of ranking number one on Google was pretty easy back then. And we, But to our surprise, within three months, it was making more than our brick and mortar language schools were. I guess the biggest advice I can give teachers, and I know they hate this, learn how to sell in marketing. <laughs> We stand today. The business method. The business with method. a shadow. The business method. The business method podcast. The business method podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their online and location-independent business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that had built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we are interviewing 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that generate a million dollars or more in annual revenue. There's a growing movement of people building these caliber of businesses, and we are getting behind the minds, the logic, and the science of what it takes to build businesses like this. On top of that, we also gather entrepreneurs at events and retreats around the world. This October, we are having our annual event in Thailand, Get Shit Done Live. It's 10 days of high-performance productivity, targeted collaboration, and rapid execution designed for entrepreneurs to get a lot of work done in a little amount of time. Some say it's like 10 months of work in 10 days. There's a magic that happens when brilliant minds come together to push one another towards productive execution. That is exactly what this retreat is about. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That is thebusinessmethod.com. Now, let's jump in today's show. The Business Method. Back in 2011, I was a lonely world-traveling digital entrepreneur living in Costa Rica. I wanted to learn Spanish as quickly as possible, so I bought an online course for $30 teaching me power verbs. Honestly, it was one of the most useful products I purchased to learn Spanish and to help me understand languages I still use that same method today. Fast forward to today, and I had the creator of that online course on our podcast to chat about how he's grown his language business into a seven-figure remote company. His name is Ray Blakeney, and his Him and his wife are the founders of Live Lingua. Ray is an American that grew up in Turkey and is now based in Mexico with his family. They started a full-fledged brick-and-mortar language school in Querétaro, Mexico, and quickly moved to growing the learning platform online. Today, Live Lingua has served over 15,000 students. They offer classes in 11 different languages, and they are helping people learn all over the world. Without further ado, I'm excited to welcome Ray Blakeney to the show. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, we have Ray Blakeney on the show. Ray, I'm excited to have you on the mic. How are you today, my friend? Not too bad, Chris. Thanks for having me. Uh, where are you calling in from? Did you say Mexico? Is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm in central Mexico right now. Just got back last night from some conferences in the U.S. Which part of Mexico? I'm in a city called Querétaro. It's about three hours north of Mexico City, kind of the central area. If you, do you spend a lot of time there? I live here most of the year. My wife's Mexican. And do you, are you there in that town because of your wife, or is, are there other reasons why you choose to base there? Actually... The first business I launched was was a brick and mortar business, and it was in this town. And we just haven't bothered leaving yet. We sold that <laughs> business. We just haven't bothered leaving yet. We own a house, and so no mortgage, no rent, no car payments. You kept the town and and left the business. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. I mean, we can live anywhere we want now, but luckily, you know, it's a nice enough place to live. What are some great things about where you're living? Just curious, you know, because we're part of an entrepreneurial group that loves to travel and loves to find new spots. So I'd love to hear why you, and can you pronounce the name of the town again? Did sure. You, Querétaro. 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 Okay. Um, you know, what are some great things about it? Well, it, it's actually not a very well-known town um, outside of Mexico, but it's actually the second richest town in Mexico, which means it's also the safest town in Mexico, generally between one and two. Um, on the safety list. It's a lot safer here than the average walking on the average street in the United States. But you get all the first world amenities. Most of downtown has free Wi-Fi. All the public buses have free Wi-Fi. Um, Uber costs $2 to get anywhere. Multiple Costco's. Um, you know, all, all the stores you're used to in the United States. But for example, the place I live, I live in the historic center. 
So my house is one of the newer ones, about 150 years old, but they're 400 year old buildings around me. <laughs> um, there's an aqueduct down the street. There's some pyramids, you know, nearby. So it does have some cool touristy things mm -hmm. without sacrificing kind of all the first world stuff that we're all used to. I have high speed internet in my house, multiple. I have two, two internet connections instead, you know, in case one goes down. It's and great. it's just really comfortable to live. And it's cheap. It's about a third of the cost of the United States. We have an international airport. I mean, I can fly directly to Detroit, to Chicago, to Atlanta, Los Angeles from my city without having to go anywhere else. What's the environment? Are you in mountains or um, plains mm -hmm. or in mountains? Mountains. Okay. Yeah, we're at about 6,000 feet. Don't quote me on that. It might be give or take 500 feet. Um, but it's about 85 degrees all year round and dry. So no wow. humidity. Nice. And the population? About 1.5, last I checked, but it's growing really, really quickly. It's a good-sized city, so that's, it's not mm -hmm. a town at all. Yeah, very cool. No, not at all. But you live in the historic center, and it feels like a town, right? Because this place doesn't change. Right. So it hasn't changed in hundreds of years. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Thanks for joining us, Ray. And um, I'd love to just kind of get into the background of you and the entrepreneur that you came, became today. I've learned some stuff about Live Lingua and you growing that business, and then also some interesting things about you growing up in Turkey and then moving through different countries throughout the, the world. I want to give you the mic just for a couple of minutes, and you can kind of give us your background as an entrepreneur to how you became the entrepreneur that you are today. Um, I'll give you the five cents tour of my childhood, and it kind of tells you a little bit about how, you know, how I developed as a person. I was born in the Philippines. My dad was a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer there. My mom was Peace Corps staff. They met. We got married. I spent the you know, first 11 months of my life there. At 11 months or so, we moved to Turkey. I spent the next 15 years there, so technically Turkish is my first language. At 15, I moved to U the U.S. to finish high school because my, you know, the international school in Turkey didn't have junior and senior year. Um, went to a New England prep school, did not fit in at all, but at least I, fin <laughs> I, sur I survived it. Um, went to college in the U.S., got my degree in computer engineering. During the I actually took, spent a year off of college to go to Silicon Valley to try to strike it rich. Didn't work, but I learned a lot. Um, went back, finished my college degree. Got out, worked for a variety of places for about five or six years, including consulting, Fortune 500 companies, U.S. government. Got bored of sitting in a cube, joined the Peace Corps. Again, myself in, I was, what, 26 at the time, 27. Came down to Mexico, met my wife, and we decided to go into business together. I always knew I wanted to go into business, but my skill set wasn't a product. Um, you know, I knew I had management background, I had IT background, I taught myself a little bit of sales, specifically SEO. Um, but I had nothing to sell. I mean, you know, what I did was not really what I was looking to, to sell, but meeting my wife who always went to own a language school, that was perfect fit. So I was in charge of the business and the marketing and all the administrative side of things while she helped create the product, which was the school and the education around it. So that's how my kind of real quick five minute journey of how I got into entrepreneurship. And I've been doing it now for over 10 years. And that first business, did that originally start off as Live Lingua or did it evolve into what Live Lingua became? It evolved indirectly into what Live Lingua became. The first business was actually a more traditional brick and mortar language immersion school for anybody who's familiar with that business model. Yeah. Um, Pretty much, you know, you would come from another country, we would place you with a Mexican family, we would give you Spanish lessons while you were here, we would give you tours around the country, kind of to learn the culture and immerse yourself in Spanish and Mexican culture. Um, about a year into it, swine flu hit Mexico. And mm. I don't know for anybody who remembers that, but pretty much there was a worry that, they were, yeah, they were going to quarantine the whole country and nobody was going to come in for years because it was going to be this big <laughs> thing. Um, the only, ironically, the only four students we had that week were these doctors from the United States who said, this is ridiculous. We found super cheap tickets and we came down because, you know, nobody else wanted to come to Mexico <laughs> during those times. So at that time, my wife actually is the one who had the idea to try to offer Spanish lessons via Skype to the students that we had had at the school before because they really liked our school and liked the teachers because our teachers were contractors. So if we couldn't meet our responsibility of providing students to them. They couldn't pay their rent and the food for their family. So we reached out. Being a computer engineer, software developer, I made a dinky little website called SpanishLessonsOnline.com. It's still there if anybody wants to look at it. It's an awful, awful website. <laughs> um, and we just threw it up there. I did basic SEO. Since we were one of the first people to offer it, kind of ranking number one on Google was pretty easy back then. And we, But to our surprise, within three months, it was making more than our brick-and-mortar language schools were. Wow. Um, and... It took us a while to realize it, but you know, about a year, year and a half into it, we were starting to burn out with our brick and mortar language schools because I hadn't had a day off in three years. Summers, I would work 90 days straight. 
through the weekends. Um, so we decided to sell. It took about two years to find a buyer, and we sold the brick and mortar language schools and decided to dedicate ourselves 100% to the online business, which evolved into Live Lingua. Okay, Spanish. Did you say Spanish lessons online.com was the name of the Spanish dash lessons dash online.com? Did you do? I couldn't get the one without the dashes. <laughs> that was already taken. Did you have like an 80 20 program? I'm not familiar with that. What do you mean? So, like, you know, or basically where you learn to power verbs. And did you have a power verb program? I'm pretty sure I bought your product when I was living in Costa Rica, actually. It and could be. It could be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, if you taught like the power verbs, because I wanted to 80 20 my Spanish more or less, I, there was a program that taught the power verbs and the major articles. And I'm pretty sure it was Spanish we, taught. We did do that. Yeah we, yeah. we did do that. So it could have been us back then I as think well. I did. So yeah. <laughs> it was like 30 <laughs> so you, bucks. <laughs> you've used our first iteration. It was an awful, awful looking website. It, um, it was basic. Yeah. I wouldn't say awful. It was basic, but it did the trick. For me, anyways, yeah. it did the job. And then we, we added tutors to that as well, which I, I don't know if you did the live tutors aspect of it, but that's did really not. the part that kind of took off. And that's really what Live Lingua dedicates itself today. We do 11 languages, okay. and it's with like live native tutors around the world for costs, like a fraction of the cost you would pay in the US. Very cool. So I have a great question for you because my girlfriend now of three years actually owns a brick and mortar Portuguese school in Rio de Janeiro. Oh. And she's struggling to get the online part of it going. She's had it for seven years and does the exact same thing that you guys did. In those early days of getting the online part of the school going, and I know you said it took you some time and you had some fortunate success with good SEO. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that you said uh, you would think that really helped you out during those early days? I'll be honest. It was 100% SEO. Yeah. Nothing else. I okay. mean, we built our, all the businesses I have built um, were built on SEO. Now with Live Lingua, it's gotten to a certain point where we're more diversified now in marketing because we have a budget. But if somebody has, you know, is starting a business and has no money, which is our case, we had $2,000 in the bank account when we started our first business. We would sleep on the floor of the school. We would take the trash out and clean because we couldn't afford a cleaning lady. Um, you know, we would do all that work. So SEO was the only possible option for us because it's tedious, it's boring, but it's effective and it's free. <laughs> Um, so we, did, I mean, I spent hundreds of hours doing SEO for our sites and that's pretty much the only thing we did for the marketing. And obviously once they're there, we gave them the best experience, you know, we could. And I think we, we had students who had studied at 20 schools before came to our school and said, this is the best school I was at and came back every year since. Oh, that's great. And so then you were selling these programs online and then basically kind of the next step was to get the students to have a live class with a teacher online, correct? Exactly. And the, the teacher, that wasn't very hard sell since the first class is always free and we've kept that model. So if you want to, you know, learn Japanese with us, we pair you up for free with the teachers and we use a specific system um, where we actually get to know you as a person, personality types, learning styles. And we have an algorithm in the back end that we've developed over the years that helps pair you up with them as well as a class coordinator. So you kind of have a human who helps you find the perfect teacher. Uh, it's unlike a lot of our competitors out there where it's pretty, they're essentially big directories, right? Where we have 10,000 teachers, great. That means you as the student have to go and search through 10,000 teachers to find one. And all, for all you know, the one you picked is just really good at writing a profile. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got nothing to do with their teaching style or if they're a good fit for you. Um, and we've kind of come up with a system that helps that, helps kind of alleviate that for the user or for the student. Um, it makes us a little less scalable, but luckily all of our competitors have literally millions of dollars of investments, right. you know, five, $10 million in VC. We started for $9 and 99 cents. Um, that's pretty much, you know, what we spent on starting live lingua. We've just been at it for 10 years and doing it, you know, putting one foot in front of the other and not really looking for explosive growth. Right. Okay. And another question, um, when did you decide to diversify uh, and go outside of just teaching Spanish? When the success of Spanish was obvious, it was kind of seemed like the logical next step. And it again, it was no cost, right? Adding an English section, a French section and all that. It, initially, it wasn't all part of Live Lingua. It was, I used I think I had online French and English lessons online dot com. And, you know, I just kind of bought all these exact match domains because back in the day that actually worked. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we were able to try it out, but I was able to pump out a website every, in a weekend, right? Because I kind of had the template in place and I just pretty much changed the word English to French and change a few words around and then I throw it up and this was pre 2012. So pre Google penguin mm -hmm. for anybody who knows, knows about SEO. 
So doing SEO was, I had a bunch of software, right? And you just kind of hit click, leave it on overnight, and it left comments and blogs. Yeah, I was that guy. Um, <laughs> you know, comments and blogs, comments and forums, spun articles that made absolutely no sense being submitted to all the <laughs> different, you know, article directories around the web. Uh-huh. And, you know, within a week, we were ranking at the top. Incredible. And any other tips for entrepreneurs that are in that space? You know, because I know you and I both know a lot of entrepreneurs that are teaching online or have online programs and trying to grow their businesses. Any other suggestions that you might recommend for those people that want to grow their online teaching business? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll put in a shameless plug, but it's actually, I'm not selling anything. I have a blog called Teacher Indie, which is dedicated exactly to that, um, which is to help teachers make, teachers and educators make a living online using, and I share a lot of my experience there. Um, my background, again, I am not a teacher, but I come from a family of teachers. My wife is a teacher and I've been running education businesses now for over 10 years. So kind of, I know the education business, um, if not necessarily the education side of things. And that's what the articles on that website are for. I guess the biggest advice I can give teachers, and I know they hate this, learn how to sell in marketing. Unfortunately, it's kind of the (laughs) type of personality that a teacher has, which is about, what is that saying? There is a teacher has never said, I do this for the money. I mean, you know, teachers generally are not doing it because they want to make a lot of money. They're doing it because they, you know, they really know, want to contribute to society and want to kind of teach and pass on information. So it's a very, I found that the hardest thing when I'm coaching teachers and I'm teaching them, it's to get that kind of mindset that's not necessarily a bad thing to sell. Because if you're selling or doing the marketing right, you're able to help a lot more people. Right. That's a really great point. Marketing and sales drives the world, doesn't it? Exactly. Whether you want, whether you like it or not, it's the truth. It's the truth. Yeah. Excellent. So give us a snapshot of what Live Lingua is today, how big you've built it and, and what the business, how many people it's affecting. Sure. Um, so we passed into a seven figure business about two years ago. And with a little bit of luck, we might hit multi seven this year, if not probably next year, as far as gross is concerned. Um, might not sound too, too big compared to, you know, the, the unicorns in Silicon Valley, but it's for a small business started by we're, we're literally a family owned business, my wife and I, um, it's not so bad. Right. And the fact that we live in Mexico, the money goes a lot farther. We have eight full-time staff and we work with about 200 to 300, um, contractors, which are our tutors. And it fluctuates a little bit as they come and go, uh, during the year. So I can tell you on the payday how much we have that payday, but it might go up or down 10 or 15, even though we have a lot of teachers who've been with us seven, eight years. So, you know, those, we do our best to te- you know, treat our teachers well, but I, we do know that the, in, in the industry, especially language te- teachers, it seems to fluctuate. English teachers, for example, they'll teach for a year or two while they're living in Thailand, where you're at right now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then they'll go back to the U.S. and get their master's, and their career will take them in another direction. So a lot of those people might not necessarily be career English teachers, even though that's kind of what we look for. We do have an Eng- you know, English teachers who have been doing it for 30 years. As far as students are concerned, we're at about 2,000 students a month um, who take classes with us. So 2,000 people a month take a class with us, at least one hour of class with us every month. So that's kind of the level we're at right now. Excellent. And any pros and cons about not having the brick and mortar side of the business anymore? I can tell you a lot of pros. I'd be hard stretch <laughs> not to, to find any cons. Um, any. The pros are obviously the location independence. We, you know, we can work from almost anywhere in the world, me and my staff included. We are a 100% virtual company. My content marketer spent three months working for me from Bali last year. My uh, lead class coordinator, which is what we call our customer support people, he's from the UK. I found him in Mexico where he lives with his family. He wanted – once he started working for us, he wanted his kids to experience the United Kingdom for a year. So he spent all of last year back in the UK working for us and now he moved back to Mexico. So kind of we have this total freedom and, you know. He had to do some strange hours, but kind of, I think he worked two o'clock in the afternoon to 10 o'clock at night. But other than that, we're totally fine with it. Another one spent a month in Greece earlier this year. So the, the advantage of flexibility is there, which ties into the advantage of no commutes, uh, no dress code. So you don't have to buy suits and stuff to come into your office every single day. And we're able to pass that on to our customers in the sense that when you take classes with us, you're not paying for our fancy building in Boston or, you know, the utilities and the cleaning and all of the facility, right? We're able to 
offer the classes at a much lower lower cost to everybody. And I think the stress is a little lower for everybody who works for us. Um, so the, these are all the pros of running an online business that's 100% online. The cons can be the lack of interaction on a day-to-day basis, but I think that only affects people who look for that. Um, I myself am introverted, so I you know, I have no problem at all kind of working by myself. And I, I, if you ask most of the staff, while most of many are outgoing, they kind of – they don't mind that and they have their families. They're able to have lunch with their families every day, right? Mm-hmm. Their kids come home for lunch and they're there at lunch with their kids. So I don't think they would – you know, it's not like they don't interact with anybody every day. And we interact regularly using our you know, Slack or Skype chat. So we all get to know each other pretty well. Is there anything you guys do in specific to keep the company – culture within and i'm sure you do that within the the employees but what about within the teachers to keep the culture and keep camaraderie and to keep them feeling like they're a part of something yeah what we what we definitely do is we try to make them feel like they're part of our family by reaching out to each one individually and not make it like a corporate structure when they start they get a welcome email from me and from my wife me as the ceo and my wife as the academic director so she kind of runs that she does regular checkups with the teachers for those who need help she's available so she'll do skype calls multiple times a week with teachers who are having trouble with students or want some tips on how to improve um i send them emails more on the business and logistical side and they have my direct email at any given time the students as well i actually send a welcome email to every single student who signs up with us um and that's because we want them to feel part of the live lingua family and not just like student you know teacher number one two three and student number four five six right so we know most of the names anybody who's communicated with us we know i have talked on skype to many teachers and we're working right now to hopefully build like a teacher portal so that the teachers can go in there and actually start bouncing ideas off of each other as well so they can even feel more like a part of the community Oh, that's excellent. So Live Lingua is doing well, and but you also own a business, a chocolate factory in the Philippines, right? Yeah, that's kind of a random side. <laughs> kind well, of sounds uh, like Most it. people find that kind of interesting. I was like, yeah. I'm like, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't like chocolate. But no, um, You don't like chocolate, yeah. No, I'm, I'm not a big chocolate fan. Luckily, my wife is, so I say whenever there's an <laughs> argument, I can just call them up and like ship over 10 pounds. <laughs> I, you know, I just put my foot in my mouth, and I need to say, I'm sorry, so they can, they can ship it all over to us. Um, yeah, that one I kind of stumbled upon. I mentor a number of people, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the girls that I mentored in the Philippines, um, she wanted to start a virtual assistant company, which in the Philippines, everybody seems to want to start a virtual assistant company. <laughs> it didn't work out. But her family was in the chocolate business. And we found out about a scholarship in Ghent, Belgium, to learn how to do chocolatiering. And she was encouraged to apply. She applied and got it. So she went over there for one year and learned chocolatiering from the chocolatiers at Godiva and Calibut and all the big chocolate companies, got back to the Philippines and wanted to start producing artisanal chocolate from the Philippines. Philippines does produce cacao, not a a huge volume, but enough to support a local market, but nobody was doing it. She didn't have the capital to start the business, so she kind of contacted me. I stayed in touch with her while she was over at the school. And my wife and I talked and we decided we wanted to go in on it. So we invested. We helped, you know, we bought all the, the machines, help set up the factory and she runs the day-to-day operations over there right now but we stay in touch i mean you know we have yeah. regular meetings and everything very cool so i'm wondering ray if this is a pattern you know you have a teaching business but you don't like te- you're not a good teacher you have a chocolate business but you don't like chocolate Do you- <laughs> <laughs> are you looking for businesses that you don't necessarily have an interest in <laughs> it could be but the thing is what i love is the creation of business i tell yeah. people i would sell donkeys if I thought it was a good business. I mean, that doesn't matter as much to me. Um, I, you know, it does have to follow my moral compass. It has to make the world a better place. I'm not going to go into a business that's, you know, against what I believe in. But other than that, the actual product is kind of secondary. Yeah. Uh, you know, it would be nice if I could sell a product I really loved, but that actually might blind me a little bit in the business field because I'd be more emotionally vested. I am not emotionally vested in any of the businesses I have. Um, it, I'm not emotionally vested in any of the products I have. Let me rephrase that. I am emotionally vested in the businesses. It's a really that lets me, yeah ahead. that that lets me be you know see them in a more objective way. I'm not looking at it, oh I love that so it must sell well. No, <laughs> yeah. No, it, a, it's you know 
It it's sells a, or it doesn't. Yeah, and I get rid of it if it doesn't. It's it's a really good point because there's a lot of people that are just in a business because they had a hobby about it, something, <laughs> and then they started it, and then they get emotionally invested in it, and sometimes it keeps them up, keeps them from making the right decisions or the best business decision or the best best profitable decision um, in the long run. So uh, it's a great point. Do you know any other entrepreneurs that kind of have that strategy to to uh, to be involved into a, a business that they don't necessarily are emotionally invested in in the products or services? Not not personally, but I'm pretty sure Warren Buffett kind of follows the same thing where, you know, he yeah. just takes an objective look at companies when he's investing them. It's not because I, you know, he wouldn't invest in an ice cream company because he likes ice cream. You yeah, know, but he would not invest in an in you know, an ice cream company because he likes ice cream either, right? He just kind of looks at the numbers and looks at it, and that's kind of the philosophy I like to apply. It sounds cold, but it kind of works um, on a lot of levels. Uh, and I mean, as I said, I love what I do. I wake up every morning excited to go to work, so it's not that I hate what I'm doing. Um, it's just that the product itself is kind of a secondary component to my job. Can you break down into words? What you love about the creation of a business and being an entrepreneur on a small level. So like you say, you you get up every day and you love what you do. What is it exactly about that entire process, creating a system, a business that you don't even have to be emotionally invested in, in the business, but not the product or service, that keeps you thriving and keeps you excited? The creativity. I love the ability to be able to to be creative in your job and being an entrepreneur these days, especially if you're kind of a low, but how would I put it? A startup entrepreneur, or you don't have a big budget. Mm -hmm. You have to be creative. If you know, if somebody gives you 10 million, you don't have to be creative. You know, you can just kind of follow, (laughs) follow exactly the pads that everybody else has laid out for you, throw a whole bunch of money into AdWords and Facebook ads. And you'll probably make a business that makes money. Maybe not enough to pay back the 10 million, but at least, (laughs) you know, profitable. Uh If you don't, you're not, you should probably not be an entrepreneur. Somebody gave you $10 million and you can't make a business that makes 50000 a year, uh, you know, you'd really have to mess up in order for that to happen. But if you are starting business on a bootstrap, and I always do, even now that we have some budget, I build business on a bootstrap. I would never put more than a few thousand dollars into a new business venture uh, when I'm starting off. Ideally, a few hundred, but that's not always possible. Um, just to see if it works. I'm a big fan of the lean startup, so kind of the whole minimum viable product thing, throw it out there, see if anybody's interested. If nobody's interested, move on um, and try something else out. But you have to, if you do find something that works, then you stick to it and you focus on it for the next three to five years. Um, people come up to me sometimes and ask, could you help me, you know, I want to build a business that in six, you know, makes about a million, grosses a million in six months. I can't help you, I have no idea how to do that. Um, I can help you build a business in five, you know, about five to 10 years, we'll be grossing a million, growing steadily day by day, learning from your mistakes. But I can't help you if you want a six month unicorn. Um, I have no idea how to do that. And I I would guess most people don't. We see all the Facebook ads, you know, saying, hey, I can teach you how to make a million dollars, you know, from your house in Thailand. Like, (laughs) yeah, I'm guessing that guy does not make a million dollars from his house in Thailand. (laughs) A couple philosophical questions for you, right? Sure. Um, actually, let's start with this one first. Uh, from an educational entrepreneurial standpoint, what do you think the difference in mentality is between a five-figure educational business, six-figure educational business, and a seven-figure educational business? Thinking in scale is probably the biggest difference. For example, a five-figure educational business can be one person. Even a low six-figure could theoretically be one person. I know a number of people and within the community you and I are in, Chris, there, I know there are other people who have six-figure educational businesses. Mm-hmm. And they're pretty much one man, sh- one man or woman shops, usually with a few staff members behind them, kind of on the support side of things. Um, but there's only so much you can do to scale at that point. You need to be able to create more scalable products, and most teachers don't think in that way, or educators, in fact, don't think in that way, right? Um, I'm guessing it's a lot to do with their training, which makes perfect sense, right? A teacher is taught how to get in, how to get in front of a classroom themselves and teach. So the idea of you know replicating themselves a hundred times to teach is not something that kind of enters their mind, whether it be done through e-courses, whether it be done through hiring and training other teachers to follow a similar method. That's really what would be necessary for a teacher to grow into a seven-figure business. Even if they remain the face of the business, they're going to need all this stuff 
behind them. If you look at almost any seven-figure business, eight-figure business that's out there, whether it be in the educational sp- space or not, there might be a figurehead, Oprah, for example, right? The, um, she might be the person in charge, but she's not the only person, right? There's all these people behind them. So you, a teachers need to learn to grow this kind of ecosystem around them, which can facilitate the growth of six- and seven-figure businesses for themselves. Let me put a little caveat at the end of that. Make sure you know why you're doing this. Because growing a seven-figure business just to grow a seven-figure business, you might be miserable. I've seen a lot of people create successful businesses that hate what their businesses have become. I think the analogy that's always, you know, climbing the mountain and realizing you're on the top of the wrong mountain. Um, (laughs) So make sure you're climbing the correct mountain before you start any of what I'm saying. Five figures might be all you want. If you're, you know, if you do want to live in, let's say, Medellin, Colombia, and when you enjoy your life, you have a family and you want to spend all the time and, you know, spend six hours a day with them and only work three hours, you could probably build a three, you know, a five figure business, fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 a year and still be able to do all of that. And it's fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 a year in Colombia. You're, you're living at large. You'll have a maid, you know, to help you clean. You won't be suffering at all. And that might be good for some people to do. Don't just do a hundred thousand because you think you should, or don't do a million because you think you should. You might be miserable when you get there. What are some tips for the listeners on how to know that they're climbing the right mountain? Ask yourself why, and you know, do that kind of recursive exercise of why. Um, you know, I want to make a million dollars. Why? And then you kind of say, okay, I want because I want to be able to do this, this, and this. Why? And then you kind of follow that all the way to the end. Do it a few times, and you will kind of get to the core of what makes you happy. And the key to the exercise is to be honest. Really, if you're why is because you want to have a Ferrari and that'll make you super, you think that'll make you super happy. That's not the wrong answer. Just because, you know, society teaches you that it should be something more altruistic. Don't, you know, fall into the trap of believing that you have to come up with some kind of altruistic meaning if that doesn't resonate with you. So kind of do that exercise, follow it through. There are other exercises out there you can do. Uh, I'll pass you the book that I would recommend for it later and you could put it in the show notes. I just can't remember the name off the top of my head. It takes about two or three hours to work through, um, but it's worth it because at the end you find out what your core value is. And the final tip that I would give, because the book can help, but sometimes all you have to do is ask the people closest to you and they know what your core value is more than you do. I mean, just by looking at you, they know what you stand for, even though sometimes you're blinded to it. Yeah, that's a really great question question to ask your loved ones for sure if you had a hundred if you knew you had 100 years more of life what would you do differently what would i do that's a great question let's see (laughs) probably work less even though i love what i do i'm a bit of a workaholic um and 100 years would give me a lot more time for the you know savings in my ira and all that to (laughs) <laughs> gain interest so I wouldn't have to worry about it. I'll be honest, my biggest stress in life is still money. Um, we're doing well enough, but I like to say that there's like four different levels of wealth when people ask, are you, you know, are you wealthy? And the first one's the, you know, Maslow level, which is you have the ba- enough to support your basic needs. Second one is you have enough to support your basic needs and pleasure, so travel or whatever it is. Third one is you make more than you need. And the fourth one is you have so much that you never have to work for money again. Um, so you don't have to stress out, even if your business goes under, even if you have a big medical thing, you you have enough to have all that covered. And I'm still working for that last one. And, you know, until I reach it, I probably will continue to overwork. <laughs> so if I had 100 years, I'd be like, OK, well, you know, I don't need to gain. I don't have only 30 years before I have to retire and the interest has to, you know, accrue on my investments. I can do wait 50, 60, 70. And that makes things a lot easier. That's a great answer. Okay, we're going to wrap up there, Ray. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your tips and tricks and wisdom with us. I really appreciate it. If the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you have going on, where's the best place they could do that at? Sure, they can contact me at Facebook. Look, just look up Ray Blakeney, and there'll be a photo of me bullfighting uh, with a sword, photo of me sword fighting in the background. So that that's kind of a, sticks out. Otherwise, go to the my blog, Teacher Indie which is just teacherindi.com and just use the contact form there. Or you can just go to livelingua.com and just contact anybody there. And even if it goes to customer support, it'll eventually trickle its way up to me. Excellent. And Ray, thank you so much again. Listeners, we want to thank you guys for hopping in on the show and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Chris. 
Hey listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high performance productivity coaching and our annual Get Shit Done live retreat in Thailand. Both are designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to get a lot of work done rapidly and whether you need some personal coaching while working away at home or a retreat in Thailand where you can get out of your normal routine and surround yourself with other successful entrepreneurs, we have those options for you. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com and we'll see you on the next podcast.